The way we industrially produce and eat food today has caused a lot of harm to our environment. But perhaps there's another way. I'm not talking here about organic farming or regenerative agriculture. Instead, we're asking a different question. What if we ate the problems we caused? Welcome to the Nature Season of Feed, a food systems podcast presented by Table. I'm Matthew Kessler. Food systems are one third of all emissions. Food systems are one of the biggest drivers of water pollution, air pollution, biodiversity collapse. So I think what we know for sure is that we need to transform food systems. But that would require kind of fundamental systemic shift. In our last episode, we heard calls to transform industrial food systems. In the next three episodes, we're asking a different question. What if, in some cases, by simply changing our perspective, we can eat some of the problems we caused and take better care of ecosystems in the process? In Mexico, we explore the pros and cons of eating grasshoppers, which have caused a lot of crop damage to some farmers. In London, we follow crayfish Bob as he traps and sells the invasive crayfish that threaten the native population. And in our last episode, we ask a conservation biologist if we can hunt enough of the overpopulated white-tailed deer to bring more resilience to the forests of the eastern United States. Each of these cases is very different but they might lead to a common solution, turning a problem into an abundant and sometimes tasty source of food. But is any solution really that straightforward? Can we do this all by eating them? Yes, we could. We cannot think that miraculously an insect or even a vegetable or a fish will provoke a change by itself First up, we look at who wins and who loses, as more and more people start demanding grasshoppers on their plates. Why exactly grasshoppers? There is a long tradition of grasshoppers in the food system in Mexico, and it was all of a sudden that also grasshoppers became a plague. So the idea of transforming a plague into a really a sustainable food was really a good question. You may recognize the voice of Elena Lazos Chavero, who spoke to us in the first season of the podcast. I am Elena Lazos Chavero. I am professor at the Institute of Social Sciences at the UNAM, that it's the National University of Mexico. Elena has an interdisciplinary background with degrees in biology and anthropology. Lately, she has turned her attention to insects as a possible nature based solution. Insects in Mexico have a very long tradition in, in the food system since prehispanic times. But since like eight years ago, um, there have been also a lot of discussions in Mexico about the future of food based on insects or nature-based solutions. They have been always considered as a very sustainable food, uh, rich in proteins, a food to alleviate food poverty and insecurity. So I was wondering if that was so. Elena is part of a bigger project examining the roles of insects in the food system across Latin America, looking at Mexico, Colombia, and Ecuador. From a quick look, this seems like such a promising solution. Grasshoppers have been a plague or a pest in many fields, eating broadleaf crops like alfalfa, maize, and amaranth. So this nature-based solution promises to eliminate this pest and turn it into a source of nutrition. But for Elena, this question isn't only about the environment, but also about the social, cultural, and political dynamics. So to approach this topic, she had to understand the many different meanings of grasshoppers, or in Spanish, chapulinas. There are festivals of grasshoppers. There is a football team called uh, chapulines. Many handicrafts symbolize the chapulines. So for some, they represent a regional and cultural symbol that they're proud of. What caught my eye and my ear was the insistence of some sellers saying that their grasshoppers were the best because they were from Oaxaca. But for others, they're a pest. And on the contrary, you know, many farmers in Puebla consider them as a serious plague for many harvests, and even they go with agrochemicals. And even in the 70s, there were a political program from the government that was to eradicate completely the chapulines. 
And they've also historically been viewed as peasant food. Even in many places of Puebla, they don't eat them. No, They consider them for poor people or for indigenous people, and they are not consider themselves as indigenous people. So the grasshoppers took on different meanings to different people. In one state of Puebla, they were trying to eliminate them, while in the neighboring state of Oaxaca, they were culturally important. But attitudes changed over time, for a variety of reasons. If you were going to make a movie about this complicated story of grasshoppers, where would you start this story? Yeah, I think that I will start the story with children. I was collecting chapulines with the children of a family and just talking with them and just discovering what they knew about, you know, the chapulines' habits, uh, where they were hiding, how to collect them, why in these plants and not in other plants, why in this uh, part of, of their parcel and not in another one. That was like reflecting a lot of environmental knowledge. And they were, you know, 9, 10, 11 years old. So it was very, very interesting for me to see. And, and I was like, where, where, where do we go? And they knew no, very well. Ah, oh, we have to go there. And I said, why not in the other part? No, no, they don't hide there. The scene Elena offers here isn't typical of the way chapulinas are harvested and roasted now. So this image of children harvesting the chapulinas is kind of like a time capsule. As she's about to get into, the market for chapulinas has changed so drastically, it's nearly unrecognizable from the family-based traditions she just described. Because the market now has been pushing a lot of um, uh, yeah, a, a massive harvest of chapulines, so that has had a lot of environmental, social, and economic uh, consequences. You said before that the children were harvesting the grasshoppers. Who is doing it now? Maybe we'll start there, and afterwards we can talk about who is eating them and what is the market like or how the market has driven those changes. Since 8 to 10, 12 years ago, it, it started to grow the business. No, They started to see that everybody was like looking for the chapulines. So then now we have a wholesome suppliers, these big uh, families that are in the business. Now they don't collect them one by one, no, but they used uh, big nets uh, that they go in the night and they collect them as, as if they were fishing with these like massive nets very, very quickly. Uh, so they pass no, these nets over the crops and yeah, it's like really fishing as, as, uh, in a big scale. You sent me a video of the the people catching, and they're they're moving around these fields almost like they would be weeding with a scythe. You know, like they would be cutting down grass, and they're doing this in this really swift motion with this net that I don't know is like two meters long or so. It seems like it's quite a technique too. Um, but like you said, it's not really discriminating. They're maybe getting more catch in, in that process. They are collecting now many, many other insects. No, uh, I was astonished of how many ladybugs, dragonflies, coleopters, no bugs, beetles, bees. Uh, even no, they told me that even they were collecting sometimes snakes or even rabbits. And so the the market start to grow. Um, not only by people from Oaxaca, but they started to send it to Mexico City. And in Mexico City, it started to be a uh, superfood because it was so nutritious with so many proteins that then uh, in Mexico City, there was a big, big demand of the uh, chapulines. So now you can find them in many bars, in many restaurants, in many markets. This might be a familiar story to you or at least a part of it. All of a sudden, some new food gets, quote, discovered and marketed as a superfood. We hear that the production is incredibly sustainable. And have we mentioned all the amazing health benefits? We've seen this with kale, quinoa, and chia seeds, to name a few. You might only interact with these food in markets, or when you go out to eat, but there's always a bigger story. In this case, as the demand for chapulinas grew, some powerful actors in the region began to take notice. 
now the business even starts to be controlled by the narco, no? in the sense that it really has become a big business and a lot of money involved on that. So um, they take it even to the United States uh, for all the Mexican population that is living in the States. So they were telling me, uh, there was a man that told me, oh, yeah, yeah, I passed 100 kilos uh, through the border. I said, that's impossible. And how do the police don't tell you anything? Well, the migration. I said, no, because everything is cooked. Nothing is raw. I No, it's nothing illegal. I said, 100 kilos. I said, wow. So then you can see that also for the Mexicans that are many are, are from Oaxaca, but also from other states uh, in the United States, then there is a big market there. I'm trying to imagine how much 100 kilos of grasshoppers are given that they are not a heavy insect. So you have to collect an enormous amount to kind of get to that that mass I did a crude calculation, and it's something like 350,000 grasshoppers in one truck. So you said like eight to nine years ago, this is where the demand started to kick in. Do you know what what caused that sort of uh, drive in demand? Was there a particular person or movement or what, what made this kind of insect revolution catch on in this area? Yeah, I think there was a big movement because of the Mexican cuisine as a patrimony heritage. And that made a lot of um, movements around Mexican cuisine. So around this time, there were more efforts to conserve traditional crops to preserve different Mexican food cultures. For example, there was a lot of discussion and investment in protecting the many different varieties of maize. This movement also included other cultural foods like grasshoppers, which, on first glance, seems to be very positive. But this national attention had some other consequences. It brought a big demand from Mexico City and from other states, no? Because when I made the map of the distribution of the chapulines, they are everywhere. And now I could find them in a market uh, in, in Merida, no? So that was a spectacular for me because I said, well, when I came like 20 years ago, nobody was like eating them and everybody was saying, no, that's really horrible to be e- eating insects. Also, you, you catch it in Cancun with all the tourists uh, and all the restaurants that are having this explosion of the Mexican cuisine. They are selling... Uh, chapulines with guacamole and in tacos, no? Or in tostadas that they will be having like appetizers, but that they are now very, very expensive, no? In, in comparison of 10 years ago. So this brings me to ask you about what are the bigger impacts of this? How, how have things changed? And I want to touch on the environmental impacts, maybe the health impacts, the social impacts. We'll unpack that one at a time. What are the environmental impacts of this type of harvest now? In Oaxaca, that there was this tradition, but that it started to grow and they started to yeah, overexploit you know, the chapulines, then now that is why there is a depletion of grasshoppers in Oaxaca. And then they need to bring them from Puebla. And now in Puebla, now it starts to be also an overexploitation. And what they say is that in some regions that there were many grasshoppers and now they don't find it. So now they are moving to the other state, that it is Tlaxcala. And now they are invading Tlaxcala, no? the collectors of Puebla. They enter the parcels of Tlaxcala or the communities of Tlaxcala in the nights, and they are collecting and collecting all the grasshoppers. So now we can see that really um, there are depletions, and, and mainly it is also because of the uh, method of harvesting, no? because of with these big nets, what they are bringing, it is a lot of, a lot of insects. And when uh, I was like looking at them and seeing, I, I was calculating that around 60 to 70 percent of the collect were grasshoppers, but the 40 percent were other insects. And now an entomologist made uh, all the list because we were collecting and the entomologist, she described all the, the species and she found 22 species of other insects that there were in this collecting system. Since we conducted this interview, Elena updated me that the entomologist found 
that the catch was actually 55 to 60 percent of all other insect species and 40 to 45 percent grasshoppers. So in that sense, well, the harvest of grasshoppers is not at all sustainable, but it's still sold as if it will be very sustainable because we are only collecting because it was a plague and we are making a service for the farmers. We don't see the other parts that it is not at all sustainable. So Elena wouldn't call the grasshoppers from southern Mexico in its current system an environmentally sustainable solution. But what about the social impacts? Now there are a lot, a lot of conflicts around the harvest. No, um, The collectors enter parcels in other communities without being authorized. So uh, among farmers, there is an ambiguity. No? For some, it's fine because they get rid of, the, of this plague, of these pests. No? But others are against it because the collectors harm and damage the crops, mainly alfalfa or the amaranth, no? that they um, step on, on it. And then afterwards, the farmers, they have a lot of problems to harvest their own crops and, and they have an important loss. No? So they have been trying to make like negotiations well, you come, you pick them, but you give me half of it or you give me uh, one third of it. And as they go at one o'clock in the morning, three o'clock in the morning, of course, the farmers are not there. So then it is a lot of complex uh, conflicts that have been around because what I was asking them who can say is the owner of the Chapulines? And well, for many people were saying, well, it's it's commons, no? Uh, other ones were saying, no, we're the owner of the parcel. And other ones were saying, well, they are, God put them da- there so I can pick them because God put them there. <laughs> so then. How are those disputes typically settled? Yeah, that's a problem that they are not settled. There are continuous uh, conflicts around this. I was really struck by how you describe this way of harvest and. And when I think about the consumers, they probably imagine a very different harvest. They imagine this sort of traditional harvest, you know, this artisan type of hand-picked or, you know, very small scale. And I imagine also the labels and the marketing around it is depicting this type of artisan harvest. How is this affecting the, the local communities? And you've already mentioned a few different communities. Like you said, the grasshoppers in Oaxaca are being depleted, and that used to be a more traditional part of their diet. So how does this play out in, in those regions? Yeah, it, for for local communities that they used to eat uh, in, during the season, it was like a daily traditional food that they will be picking all the time. no? And it was important because it was when there was... Uh, no maize, no. There was the the harvest of maize. It is until October, so the chapulines will be coming to not like replace all the maize, of course, but it was an important component of the the food diet of daily uh, peasants. Of course, now they they prefer to sell it because it represents more money, and even no, sometimes they. Well, children, they like it very much, no? And I see that all the time children come and, and try to, to eat a little bit and the parents are saying, oh, no, 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 I'm going to take them to the market. I'm going to take it to the market, no? So then you see a, a, a big difference for their own diets. And also, as it has become so expensive, for example, the urban uh, workers that used to buy you know, their, their chapulines and have a taco during the day, of chapulines. When I was like interviewing these consumers, they told me, oh, no, no, before I could eat one taco of chapulines daily. Now it is once in the week, no? So because it has become very expensive. And then I I prefer to buy pasta that it's cheaper or other kind of food that it's really very, uh, yeah, rich in calories, but very low in, in nutrients and not as chapulines, no? So then there has been really a change in the diet. Yeah, so then this discourse about chapulines as alleviating food poverty, it it is not so, no, because the market has been uh, driving this uh, economic impulse, so then they are selling it in in order to to have a little bit more of, of money. Elena sees grasshoppers, in this case, as not fulfilling their promise, that of improving food security and providing support for rural communities. 
But what about cooking in health? Is it offering a good source of nutrition for those who can afford it? I think there are two aspects that we have to consider uh, very important. One, it is when they are collecting it, we don't know if really the day before the farmer spray an agrochemical and then afterwards, well, the, the chapulines were eating perhaps maize that was all already with this agrochemical. There is no sanitary regulation at all. So this is one part. And the other part, it is that before they were cooked as roasted only. No, uh, they put it in these big like plates that we call them comales, and they will be roasted there. And now they are fried and uh, with a lot, a lot of cheap oil. Once they, they pour eight liters of, of um, oil, no, I was like, eight liters? Of course, it was a big pot. But I said, wow, no, because they were combining it with peanuts, no, because as appetizers, they, they are very, very popular now in the parties or in the, um, in the bars or in the restaurants to have these appetizers, the peanuts and, and chapulines mixed, no? But they have so much oil. No, they are cooking very cheap oil. So now it is like children before they like it only roasted. And now they prefer this combination with the peanuts. And we see them that they are really eating a lot, but it is all greasy. So then you have like this transformation in the cooking has also have an impact in the health. My question to wrap this up is, how have your views changed on nature-based solutions after you've spent so much time with, with these chapulinas? Yeah, I think that with all food, we have to analyze the context. And we cannot think that miraculously an insect or even a vegetable or a fish will provoke a change by itself positive change in the food system, no? Uh, we have to see really all these cultural, economic aspects that they will be driving into one or other aspect that we didn't consider it before. Some positive, of course, some negative, of course, no? So then uh, when we say, oh, yeah, no, the Chapulines will be alleviating the food poverty, it was really very naive to consider it like that. And we have to, to see, well, what are the economic drivers that have been provoking this overexploitation, for example, and depletion of biodiversity? And socially, what is happening? So insects or grasshoppers in this case don't necessarily pass the test as a, a positive nature-based solutions from how they're sold and packaged to what the reality behind the scenes looks like. Yeah, I think so, that we have to consider a lot of regulations, no? And the communities will be regulating the harvesting and who has the right to harvest, when and how much. It is not that it will be forbidden, of course not, but in the sense of how to regulate these activities, that is the big question. And also, of course, now that has become so, so popular um, in the in the food uh, diet of, of the, many of the Mexicans, you cannot say, nah. And if there is a good regulation and a good information, I think it could be you know, uh, still a good possibility to be eating uh, chapulines because it's cultural embedded, the traditional Mexican cuisine. But I think that we have to always see put it in, in a balance and, and really working very much in the regulation. I think that's a hopeful place to leave it at, that there is a, an opportunity for them to be produced and consumed in, in ways that benefit perhaps health and environment. But in the present form, it needs some work to get there. So, uh, Elena, thank you so much for speaking with us. It was a big pleasure, Matthew. Thank you very much for the invitation. A big thanks to Elena lazos Javero and to you for listening. Next week, we'll look at crayfish. As of this year, Table has expanded its collaboration between the University of Oxford, Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences, and Wageningen University in the Netherlands to the Americas. We now welcome the University of the Andes in Colombia, National Autonomous University in Mexico, and Cornell University in the United States. 
You can follow our work by subscribing to our newsletter, Fodder. This episode was edited and produced by me, Matthew Kessler. Music by Blue Dot Sessions.